All right, we're here today to talk about return to serve. And I want to make one really important point. And we all know this. The return to serve is by far the most under-practiced shot in tennis. Now consider this. And I met with Craig O'Shaughnessy, who's the lead analyst for the ATP Tour and the Grand Slams and writes for the New York Times. Also interviewed Warren Pretorius, who has uh, tennisanalytics.com and Craig's website is uh, tennisbraingame.com and the reason I share that I spoke with them is these guys are heavily into the facts of the game so there is no speculation with the information I'm going to share the average point pro tour for men is 4.2 hits the average point women's pro tour 3.7 top juniors every age group in North America US and Canada 12s 14s 16s and 18s, boys and girls, average point at that level, national top level, is four hits also. That means 50%, right, of the shots hit in tennis are the serve and return of serve. Now with that, of all the shots hit in tennis, this is average length of a point, right? Here, get out, get out your calculators. What percentage are return of serves? Full 25%, okay? What about at recreational levels? We're talking about 3.0, 4.0, kids, juniors, intermediate kind of levels. The average point is more like three hits. What percent, if it's three hits, are the return of serve? Anybody? 33%. So we've got a range of all shots that anyone will ever hit in tennis of being between 25% on the Pro Tour, to at recreational levels, 33%. How much do we practice out of every, let's say, 10 hours that our teams are practicing on court? What percent are practiced drilling the return of serve? That's the question. Most people say you held up 5%. That's what Craig O'Shaughnessy felt about 5% across the board, many less. Here's the analogy. Baseball, you got an infielder. What three main things do they have to do? They've got a bat, they've got a field, and they've got to be able to throw to first base. Pretty much, right? Those are the three basic. What if they only practice batting and throwing but not fielding? What kind of baseball team would that be? What about football, quarterback? What three things do they have to do to oversimplify it? They've got to be able to hand off for running plays, right? Pretty basic. They've got to be able to pass short, screen, rollouts, and they've got to be able to pass long. What if one-third of everything that they did was not practiced? What if they didn't practice short screen passes, short plays? Can you imagine? I mean, pro teams, football and baseball, would have nothing of that sort of practice habit or those sorts of practice patterns. Very, very important. So in tennis, we under-practice. We under-practice the return of serve. So let's take some of the mystery out of it. If we interviewed each of you separately and said, what do you have your players do? What are some of the variables? Variables are grips. Variables are whether you move forwards or backwards, right? Variables are the degree of your backswing. Variables are whether or not you chip or hit more aggressively. The variables are what you do after the return. And if we interviewed all of you, I guarantee of all those variables, we wouldn't find one coach recommending the same thing. And there's good reason for that. And the reason is there are variables there partially with good cause. Let's feed some balls. You guys just hit, um, we've got Nicole and Matt. Thank you for being with us. And we're just feeding, I don't know, it's probably 70, 80 miles an hour just to give us a starting point. And you can hit, why don't you hit three, and we'll see what she does. Matt, you want to come in? Three each. Now we have this for a reason. They're both forward movers. With the ball speed that you're getting, we want to make a channel to guide behavior. How many of your players 
move laterally instead of forwards if you want them to get forward, right? A lot of them. So like closing in at the net if you're poaching in doubles. Very important to close in and angle forward. So let's try a couple more. Start if you want. Let's slide out of the way. Let me just demonstrate one thing. You could start here. What pro player does this? Starts like this. Anybody? Murray. McEnroe's lefty, but that, that was the giveaway. Right? Andy Murray starts like this, then moves forwards. And you see how I'm in front? So let's have you demonstrate Andy Murray. Forwards. Take that split forwards. I know you know it's coming to your forehand. Split. One more. Start behind. One more. Ready? The same timing, same sequence. Good hit. So you can see the distance he's ending up. Now, what about players that move backwards? Right? Let's have Nicole demonstrate moving backwards. So start inside the baseline, right? And let's have you move backwards, load, and hit a pretty high heavy. Start in, start in closer, and then start, and then back up. So intimidate your, let's do one more. Start in. This is unusual for her, you can see. Okay, Matt, you want to give it a try? Come on in. In, Matt, start inside the baseline. Start inside, way inside, way inside. Now, then back off. Inside. Back, load. Good. So right away, we've got two options. Now, they clearly know it's coming to the forum. We don't want to challenge them too much. So we've got moving forwards. We've got moving back. What about grips? I mean, what about grips? I was speaking with Craig O'Shaughnessy yesterday for a while about top pro players. What are they doing? And the answer is they're doing mixed things. He personally recommends starting forehand with your strength. Even though most serves, two out of three at the pro and top collegiate levels are coming to the backhand because it's an easier change. Right? We know that. It's an easier change using your non-racket hand. But some players want to remain in neutral. Here's a question. Who does this when they're waiting for a returning serve? Why? Why does Roger Federer spin his racket? To, one person said to change his grip to where he wants it, so it's variable. I think that's a hard way to do that myself. Does anybody want, but it is, it is a good point, and the premise is so he can change because it's not fixed, which is which is a correct answer. What about anybody else? Why would Roger Federer, why, is this just totally an idiosyncrasy of Federer that he spins? Stay loose. I love that answer from my alma mater. Okay, stay loose. Because how tight should we hold the grip when we're returning serve? If we're going to have to change grip, we want to hold it not like a bird. We want to hold it like a bunch of feathers. I mean, so loose that it's a feather-like grip. You know, one thing interesting about the return of serve is you seldom see good returners go all the way back to here. Notice? Let's watch Nicole and Matt on their forehand returns. You stand and move however you want. All right? Now look at her backswing, and you'll see her racket. Now, where is her racket when it goes back? I paused it. But you are wound up. I love it. All right. Her racket was back to about here, Matt, right? Now, depending on the server, she'll be in good shape. But if a server serves slow in the warm-up and then she has trouble getting her timing against a harder serve, she has to learn to have a plan B. How can you generate racket head speed without taking the racket back further? a good question. So if I want to deal with the racket here, let's watch Matt hit a few forehands and let's see the extent of his backswing, all right? Now is Matt's racket 
position on the backswing further or less? Right? It's a lot less. So how does he generate pace? Nicole uses her shoulder as a hinge. Right, Nicole? You know what I mean. That's why you have a longer stroke. And Matt incorporates a little more wrist. Right? So you see him flexing in here. And it kind of looks like a, I like it to think of it as a door on a hinge. That's loose. All right, let's have you drop your pinky off the bottom of the racket. How tight are pro players gripping on ground strokes? Before contact, at contact, and after contact. A number. Ten is a death grip. One is really loose. We got a four. Four, four, four. Matt, what are you, do you think? I mean, I can tell. I've interviewed top 200 players in the world, like 20 of them. Let's have Matt hit a couple. You know what the answer was? Zero, two, zero, or one, three, one. That's how to get swing speed when you talk about swing speed okay so let's have you hit a couple and try to loosen up a little bit more than normal and be conscious so you loose loosen up experiment if you miss you miss Now, do you feel that gripping, we, we, I paused it, did you feel like the gripping looser gave you more pace? Significant, right? How much more, 30%? Isn't that really interesting? And just one little tip like that to generate more pace, and if you combine that with adding ball rotation, a little more low to high on swing path, you don't lose control. And what do best players do? They aim for big targets. Let's get into targeting on the return of serve. Because the return is so important these days, there's so much statistical analysis going on, that guys like Craig O'Shaughnessy and Warren Pretorius are there and they're sharing this information. So here's a drill that's a, a favorite, actually, of Craig's. He shared it with me. I had done something similar years ago. The scoring is very simple. Let's give you two points if it lands in the back area. Zero if it's short, right? And you've got negative one if it lands in the service box, out or wide. Now picture this over many days of practice, right? Then they get into a match. They will be visually locked in to the pattern that scores them points. Simple drill. But we're talking about behavior modification a little bit with tennis players, aren't we? I mean, it sounds like we're training a <laughs> you know, German Shepherd. But the real truth is that we are trying to modify behavior. And all tests and all clinical studies with sports, whether it's golf, skiing, tennis, baseball, football, basketball, state that when you use visual guidance systems, that you're increasing the speed of learning and improvement by 200%. All right, he's got one. You've got three, first to five. Here we go. Relax. Out. He's down. He's got plus one. So he's at two. That's it. You're in, Nicole. He's got four, and you've got three. She just needs one. That's it, folks. But the point is very clear. Give them targets. Make them work for it. And repeat them over and over again. So you have three things, at least, that you've got to be consistent with. Consistent... Rituals, consistent decisiveness. What does consistent decisiveness mean? Right? It means committing. Committing to whatever shot you think you're going to hit. Make that decision. And consistent targeting. Very important. Okay, let's do, you guys, let's do a chip return. On the Pro Tour, th they call these butterfly returns because they kind of float. Same game as earlier, but now we're doing a Stan Warinka. 
right, where he stands in, and the ball is a little bit fast for him. He's neutralizing. He's not going to overpower. But he wants to be consistent, get it deep, and get into the point. And these are part of consistent rituals, right, consistent decisiveness, and consistent target. Very important for returning serve. Three shots each, same game, same rules. He's got two. He's got four. Let's play to ten, okay? He's got four. Nicole, she's got two. She's got four. She's got six. Matt, you're up. He's got four. He's still got four. He's got six. He's got six still. She can put it away. She needs two. She's got eight. And she's got ten. So really interesting to me that you can see how they are doing with chipping versus swinging. And, you know, it used to be don't chicken out, don't back off on your return. But we're seeing top players in the world, if it works, you know, and it helps them win more matches, it doesn't mean that they're not going to step in and attack that forehand on the second serve. Let's do some drills to help them speed up now. On page two, I believe, of the handout that we gave you, charts the amount of time you have. Look at the 90 mile per hour serve. In the 90 mile per hour serve, you've got three quarters of a second. Now follow me on this one. All right. When a 90 mile an hour serve is reaching the net and it comes from the server's racket to the net, we're talking about 25 one hundredths of a second. So 0.25 seconds lapsing. You with me? All right. Now, when it comes to the other side and it bounces, typically we average that the ball after the bounce slows down in half, the ball speed. So we're going to say when it's on this side of the net, you have half a second. If your rituals are inconsistent, if you don't know whether you're going to hit topspin or backspin, if you don't know where you're aiming, <laughs> I mean, think about it. Your return to serve percentages are going to be horrible. What is one thing that all top four players on the men's circuit have in common besides their win-loss record? You know what shot they hit best? Take a guess. They are the four best players in terms of return of serve percentages. Their serves are not the best serves, but their return of serves are. This is really, I thought it was a real eye opener. Again, the top four players in the world, they have the top four statistics of all players on the men tour, men's tour in terms of the return of serve. Not the serve, but the return of serve. And again, the return of serve constitutes 25 to 33 percent of all shots in tennis. And it is, yes, it is the most underpracticed shot. What are ways besides a, a, a ball machine like this that's all in one? What are the four different ways to feed balls to practice the return of serve? Because there are four main categories. Number one. We'll start at the, should we start at the least expensive and go up, or the most expensive and go down? Least. The least is that you serve, all right? And you serve for hours. Or you have an assistant coach that serves a lot of balls that's got a really healthy rotator, all right? So you have a human being serving. If you've got to hire a coach and you're a parent, you're junior, you know, it could get expensive, but you get the point. Serving. Next position, you get a, a ball machine that costs six or seven hundred dollars and you build scaffolding. And I'm serious. And look at the drawing on page three of the handout. It shows point of contact heights on the serve and where to put it on the court. So you could potentially put a couple of ladders and a board between and a very small portable machine up around this height, like seven feet. I mean, this, this simulates, this machine simulates a, a six-foot-tall server because it throws the ball at nine feet. 
all right? But you could do it with two ladders and scaffolding. Then you get to a ball machine like the Ace Attack, which is admittedly more than six or seven hundred dollars. It's more like close to seven thousand nowadays. And then you've got the Playmate, which is the gold standard or has been, with the lift built in for thirteen thousand four hundred. The package. And they're both great machines. And so is the one on scaffolding. And so is the coach who's serving. It's all good. My point is, do something. If you're only practicing the return of serve, 5% of your practice hours, you are falling short as a coach. I asked Craig O'Shaughnessy, the guy, you know, he's got, he lives in Austin, Texas. I'm based in Dallas. He has family in Dallas. He was flying through. We got to a club where one of these machines were there, and we were, you know, testing it out and so forth. And uh, Craig, you know, was flying out to the U2 arena for the men's ATP Tour Finals, right, Final Eight. And, uh, man, he was talking about it with me like crazy. And I asked him, you know, what coaches are really working on the return of serve? And he was like, you know, nobody, no academies are really emphasizing returning serve. But I can tell you the results will be there for your team. At least 25% of all the balls hit that you practice should be returning serve. If not, you're not servicing your players well. And to play catch up from the previous years of their life never hitting returns really in practice, you may want to bump it up to 50%. 70% of all points on the Pro Tour end by the fourth shot. 70%. Men and women. 20% are, are points between five and nine balls hit. That means two and a half each to four and a half each. And only 10% are more than 10 or more balls in a row. That means five each. The average person that hits on a ball machine, what do they do? Have you guys seen it? It drives me nuts. They stand and they hit 30, 40 balls in a row. It is totally unrealistic. Do patterns. Get them moving. Get them recovering. Let's do some drills now that are a little different for you guys to wrap it up. Uh, first one. You can go first. Put your right hand on your right hip. There we go. And now you're going to start off returning grabbing your grip. Now, if you can see the flashing light, can you see the red light from there? All right, so you can see it. When it flashes, you've got three flashes and the ball's coming out on the third flash. So let's have you do three. Matt, when it's your turn, you're going to put your hand in your pocket. Uh, after the second one, you can grab your grip. Because we want to speed up. If she's going to be relaxed, she's got to be decisive about what side it's coming to forehand or backhand, she knows on this one, because we don't have it on random, to make it simple for the demonstration. And she's got to be decisive, and she's got to be committed to what grip she's going to hit with. So you decide whether you're going to chip or hit topspin. Here we go. On your hip. There we go. Good. You feel like you're a little looser than normal? Good. Matt, you're in. Nice returns, huh? Feel free to applaud, it, especially if Nicole hits a great shot. She told me she hadn't had enough standing ovations recently. Okay, Matt, out. Grip. What other drills with the return of serve can you do? Obviously, besides point scoring, I'll give you some movement drills. Okay, here we go. You're going to start at the Start back against the fence. Matt, you go first, please. All right. As soon as it flashes, I want you moving. Is that clear? Here we go, Matt. Go. Good, Nicole. Now start halfway in. Okay, two more each. Halfway in, go forwards, and make contact inside the baseline. There we go. The heavy ball he's hitting. Are you playing loose still? Two more each. One. And one more. Matt, one more. What I found really interesting, do you see the depth they're hitting with now? As compared to earlier when they were, right? So 
So part of it, were you guys aware of your target? Sort of, kind of? Always? What about ball recognition? Right? When do you want to recognize whether it's a forehand or a backhand? Where does the ball have to be when they identify whether it's a forehand or a backhand? I mean, we can put it on random, but we're going to save the time in doing that. Where, I mean, by the time it crosses the net or before, they got to decide really fast. Let's compare it to baseball. Baseball, you got a 90 mile an hour pitch, right? You're 60 feet away from the pitcher. What's the good news? Good news is you know it's on the right side of your body if you're a right-handed batter. That's the good news about baseball, right? But you got a lot of decision making because the strike zone is fairly small and they can throw curves, sliders, knuckleballs, whatever other words that they have for the innumerable amounts of variety of pitches, right? But it does make it easier. Tennis is tough. It's tough. They need to work on the return of serve. I always say there are, you know, good four, I mean, you could say three basic serves on each side for flat slice and kick, right? Because you got placement wide. We have it set up right now on a little bit of slice. Don't hit it, Matt, okay? Got a little bit faster. It's at about 80% full speed. All right, pretty flat, but we got a flat serve coming into this target. I'll make sure I don't get popped here. And then we got body. So we call it, you know, ABC, right? Alley, body, center. Then we got slice in all positions and kick in all positions. Pretty wild. That makes how many on each side? Nine. How many total? 18. Man. You wonder why the target zone, when they say deep down the middle, keep it simple. It's already complicated. Okay? All right, folks. Practice, obviously, the most under-practiced shot in the world, which is the return of serve. So, great stuff. Easy to control. Remote control for on and off. Thanks for joining us.